You may have noticed a lot of brand name products on your favorite shows lately, like this one, or this one, or all of these. This practice goes back a long time. Some scholars argue that this beer bottle in this 1882 painting by Edward Monet could be product placement. See that red triangle on the label? That identifies it as a product of the English company Bass Beer. Now, whether that was product placement, a critique of mass production, or something else is entirely lost to history. But one thing is certain, product placement today is more widespread than ever. And it's about to get a whole lot more futuristic. The term product placement wasn't used until the 1980s, but the idea itself debuted nearly a century earlier in an 1896 film by the Lumiere brothers. Did you catch it? It's right here. The soap they're using is a product of the British company Lever Brothers. From here, product placement became an entrenched part of film production, from train lines to Hershey's chocolate to De Beers diamonds and a whole lot more. Most of these placements weren't paid in the sense of, we give you money and you put this product in your movie. It was more like, you need a car for your movie, use ours for free. Or, both parties created massive cross-promotional campaigns featuring the product and the movie. But for all the hype, these methods didn't translate easily to television. First, because networks didn't want to give up any of their limited ad time. And second, because making TV was a lot less expensive. So teaming up with companies to lower production costs wasn't as necessary. So for most of the 20th century, product placement was mostly in movies, and it was a pretty informal affair. Just company executives and movie producers throwing things on set, seeing what would stick. That is, until this happened. This is, of course, a clip from 1982's E.T., The Extraterrestrial. It was the biggest smash hit of the 1980s, both in audience numbers and product placement. See, the script originally called for Elliot to lure E.T. to his house with M&Ms, but the Mars company shied away from the publicity. So E.T.'s co-producer struck a deal with a Hershey's marketing executive. Instead of M&Ms, Elliot would use Reese's Pieces. In exchange, Hershey would produce a $1 million promotional campaign for the film. Sales of Reese's Pieces, which had only debuted two years earlier, exploded. This iconic partnership kicked off the golden age of product placement. At their best, these deals did for other products what E.T. did for Reese's Pieces. Tom Cruise rescued these classic Ray-Ban glasses from near extinction by donning them in 1983's Risky Business. And 1995's Toy Story resurrected several classic toys for a new generation. Psychologically, when we're exposed to a persuasion attempt, yeah, and we recognize it as a persuasion attempt, your defenses automatically go up. We don't have the same reaction necessarily with product placement if it's incorporated into the programming that we're interested in. That's especially true if it's done in a way that fits. You know, in the Marvel movies, Audi provides many of the vehicles. So Tony Stark driving, you know, in Audi uh, supercar. We don't think anything of it. The integration, it's much more subtle. It doesn't come across as that blatant persuasion attempt. The flip side is that product placement can be, you know, a little too much. Like when an over the top, five week long cross promotional deal between Diet Coke and friends nearly tanked the fledgling show. It was so involved that it turned a lot of people off. And I think that that's sort of the, the line that a lot of these brands and these advertisers have to walk. And so that balance is really difficult to strike. And I think that's something that we continue to see being worked out. In spite of these risks, something changed in the early 2000s that made product placement much more appealing to the small screen. TiVo was the game changer of all game changers. And for any of you that were too young to remember TiVo, it was a service that allowed you to pause and record live TV. Now that viewers had the power to skip traditional TV ads, the value of those ads plummeted. One study estimated that the total wasted ad money was about $5.5 billion by 2007. 
if I know that people are now skipping the commercials that I'm paying for, I need to find some other way of reaching those consumers. That's when brands really started looking at the value of product placement and focusing on a need for product placement versus just a nice to have element. Total spending on product placement in television jumped from 330 million in 1989 to nearly 1.9 billion in 2004, overtaking the total value of the same advertising in movies. And this advertising apocalypse ramped up in the following years for two main reasons. The first, sheer number of shows. Market research firm PQ Media noted that the total number of shows in just the United States reached over 500 in 2019, which is double what it was in 2010. More shows equals more fragmented audiences equals fewer eyes seeing your ads. And a big chunk of those shows are found on the second reason that product placement took off. Streaming platforms. Streaming further fractured audiences into smaller and smaller groups. So advertisers once again turned to product placement to get eyes on their stuff. But today's product placement is pretty different from its predecessors. Think of the Friends Diet Coke campaign as a sledgehammer, hitting all 30-ish million viewers. Those viewing numbers aren't possible today because of those fractured audiences. So product placement today is more like a scalpel. Using viewer data, brands can target very precise audiences. And for brands, chasing ad-averse youngsters? That's invaluable. Data suggests that this type of advertising is extremely effective. In a 2018 study by Branded Entertainment Network, a major player in this type of marketing, they found that product placement is 11% more effective in driving purchases and 10% more effective in supporting brand affinity over traditional 30-second commercials. And on Hulu specifically, those numbers reach 89% and 74%. But even that form of product placement, physically having the product on set during filming, may soon be just as antiquated as that original Lever Brothers soap ad. The digital age is poised to revolutionize advertising all over again. For instance, Branded Entertainment Network developed a way to predict which shows will become popular before they even go live. And so what we've done is we've custom built a deep learning algorithm. And based on all of the historical data we have, it's projecting an impression number of that new content. In plain English, if a superstar actor or director is involved, that show will get a higher score and a higher score means potentially more product placement. But the most futuristic advancement is still on the horizon, digitally altering products and shows depending on who's watching. It's almost like using a uh, green screen technology to digitally insert different products. So replace the Coke with a Pepsi. That's sort of the holy grail for a lot of people is trying to figure out how can we actually take over this space programmatically. Currently, that technology really only works with background elements, things you as a viewer can see, but characters can't interact with. For example, this Pepsi poster in the background of a popular Univision show, or these banners surrounding soccer fields. Yeah, I played that scene in Minority Report where Tom Cruise is walking through the shopping mall with the stolen retinas, and he's getting targeted advertising. At the time, we said, oh, this is crazy science fiction, now that's reality based on the technology that we currently have. So I wouldn't be surprised at some point in the future if we're able to do it. See, COVID-19 broke a 10-year growth streak in the value of product placement in television globally. But PQ Media predicts the number will bounce back to 13.8% growth in 2021. Still, product placement will always have to adhere to those do's and don'ts in order to be effective. Just look at the recent remake of the 90s movie She's All That, featuring TikTok star Addison Rae. Viewers roasted it on the internet for its over-the-top placements. If a program becomes known as this program's just gonna hawk whatever product they're being paid for, and I don't enjoy seeing that many instances of blatant marketing, I'm not gonna watch that program. I'm gonna find something else. We wanna hear your best or worst examples of product placement. Do you remember the Friends Diet Coke debacle? Or are you more of a mocking he's all that on TikTok? Let us know in the comments and be sure to subscribe so you can catch the next video.